Hello, everybody. Um, welcome to Transfigured. Um, my name is Sam. Um, I am the host of this channel. This channel uh, explores theology and philosophy, specifically topics related to the Trinity or alternatives to the Trinity and um, understanding that from a variety of different perspectives. Um, some people have been asking me recently to make a podcast version of my YouTube channel, not knowing that there already is a podcast version of my YouTube channel. So I just wanted to um, do that little bit of housekeeping. So if you're one of those people who's been bothering me to make a podcast, if you search for Transfigured in Apple Podcasts or whatever your favorite podcast app is, you'll, you'll probably find it. So uh, I just wanted to answer those questions at the beginning. And I'm really excited today to have on the channel Dr. Shabir Ali. Um, Dr. Shabir Ali is probably, I would say, one of the most prominent YouTube apologists for an Islamic perspective that I know of. Um, at least certainly when it comes to the topic of the Trinity, he's one of the Islamic apologists that I have seen the most of on the internet and does a, a really good job talking on that topic often in debates. There's a lot of um, famous debates with Dr. Shabir Ali with uh, Trinitarian Christians um, that if you search for, I'm sure that you'll find, find right away. Um, but he has a, a PhD from the University of Toronto and he is the president of the Islamic Information and Dawa Center International in Toronto. So um, uh, could you uh, please uh, introduce yourself any more beyond what <laughs> I just said, Dr. Shabir? Well, not much more to say than, than what you've already mentioned. Um, you know, in terms of my personal life, I was uh, born in Guyana in South America. I migrated to Canada when I was uh, just a teenager. I went to school in, in Canada and uh, then pursued my my. Uh, you know, graduates and postgraduate uh, degrees in in um, in, in Toronto. Um, I, I I live in Toronto. I, I'm married. I have uh, four children and uh, three uh, grandchildren. Oh, well, congratulations! Uh, <laughs> thank you. Um, so I'm getting along in years. And in terms of uh, my professional activity, I also appear weekly on a television program called mm -hmm. Let the Quran Speak. Uh, those who are in Canada can watch it uh, on TV, and uh, those from around the world can uh, see it uh, on, on, on our YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, you, you've really sort of embraced the, the internet and YouTube and those sorts of tools as, as a way to do uh, outreach. Um, what sort of got you interested in, in doing that? Well, you know, my, my involvement in internet uh, debates is actually very recent. It is the COVID-19 um, lockdown that, that forced me into that venue. Previously, I used to say, you know what, uh, I'm not so familiar with uh, the internet. And, uh, you know, if you want me for a live debate, uh, I'll be glad to show up in person. Um, and I did a lot of traveling for that reason. But uh, when, when the lockdown started, uh, you know, the, the, the obvious <laughs> alternative to traveling was to appear on, uh, on internet uh, um, sure, platforms yeah. such as yours. And, uh, and so I, I naturally got channeled into that. And I love it now, uh, you know, now that things are opening up and the restrictions are being lifted, uh, I, I still want to um, retain, you know, doing uh, such discussions uh, over yeah, <laughs> I, I can say, um, well, for the most part, COVID has been really miserable and unpleasant in most ways. Um, as a uh, YouTube channel host, one benefit is it is, has been a little bit easier uh, to get people to come on a YouTube channel because pretty much everyone knows how to use Zoom now when it works. <laughs> and, um, yes. and there aren't a lot of other choices. So that's at least a, a, a benefit of, of this whole rough situation. So how did you... Um, get so interested in the topic of the Trinity and what Christians believe about the Trinity and giving informed um, responses to that? Well, you know, I, I grew up in, in Guyana, as I've already mentioned, and uh, uh, there uh, some, some of, of our youth, uh, you know, started to become attracted to Christianity. They were Christian missionaries uh, who were doing a fair job of uh, reaching out through various means. And, um, uh, you know, that, that got us naturally into discussions about which religion is right and uh, how do we know uh, who is God and all of that. So I, I did some reading 
Uh, but uh, it was when I came to Canada as a teenager that uh, I was often visited uh, by Jehovah's Witnesses in particular, but other uh, Christians as well, uh, inviting us to their faith. And uh, naturally, we got into discussions about the truth of various matters. I had to dig deeper, and uh, in, in such conversations, uh, naturally, the question of who exactly is God comes to the fore, and uh, often it is Trinity versus uh, uh, the, the Islamic view of monotheism. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and for for anyone who is is not aware, I maybe should have said this earlier. I am a Christian, but I'm a non-Trinitarian Christian. Um, but I'm also not a Jehovah's Witness. <laughs> um. Yes, yes, <laughs> and and just to be clear, Sam, in case someone might construe my statements as indicating that I think the Jehovah's Witnesses are Trinitarians, no, of course they're not. Right. Um, they're they're uh, Unitarians of the uh, Aryan. Uh, sort yes. of persuasion yes mm -hmm. so yeah just sort of briefly I, I kind of there's three main camps in Christianity there's Trinitarianism which is sort of the overwhelming majority and also it's kind of viewed as the orthodox default and there's Arianism which would say that Jesus pre-exists as some sort of divinity or deity but not the true highest god himself um, and then he became a man, like in Jehovah's Witnesses style, they believe that he was the Archangel Michael, they're relatively unique in that view, but Arian views were common in early Christianity and then were eventually decided to be heretical. Um, and then there's biblical Unitarianism, or sometimes called Socinianism, which is the idea that Jesus is just a man, he's uh, empowered by God, he's the Messiah, he's the Son of God, and those sorts of things but he did not exist in any personal sense before his birth, and he is a genuine human being. Um, so, uh, and I come from that third camp. Um, and as far as I know, most, most Muslims are not aware of, of my camp, and I, I don't blame them because we are a small minority and we certainly feel the uh, downsides of being a small minority. Um, but uh, I, I think that biblical Unitarians and, and Muslims can understand each other quite well. It's not to say that we don't have our disagreements on some things, because we do. Um, but but we, I, in my conversations and interfaith dialogues, um, Muslims often find it refreshing if they don't know previously uh, of this sort of Christianity, because they find it much more familiar and much more logical. Mm -hmm. Yes. And in fact, uh, Sam, uh, some Muslims who have done a little bit of reading on the, the development of the Trinity and the history of Christianity and so on, uh, they, they became attracted to Socianism. And um, uh, they, they uh, you know, many Muslims who have come to uh, stumble upon uh, Socianus and his uh, ideas and uh, in the Middle Ages, some other thinkers uh, in addition to him, um, have come to feel that uh, Unitarian Christianity is the true and original Christianity. And finally, you know, there's a group of Christians who uh, can be identified as, uh, in the Muslim opinion, the true followers of, of Jesus. Yeah, well, that's certainly what we like to think we are of ourselves. Uh, but, but so does every other kind of Christian, as far as I can tell. <laughs> um, but, but that's our own problem. So um, in, in your opinion, how did the doctrine of the Trinity develop and, and where did it come from? If, if Unitarian Christianity is more authentic to the original teaching of Jesus and his apostles in the New Testament, how did it come to be the case in, in your understanding that the vast majority of Christians are Trinitarian and even think non-Trinitarians are either heretical or don't even count as, as Christians. Hmm. So there are a few factors. I think one, one factor um, is that in, in the environment in which the message of Jesus was preached uh, af after Jesus left the scene, uh, it, it, people uh, naturally took uh, uh, great men and heroes to be gods. And we see this in, in Acts uh, chapter 14 in the Bible, mm -hmm. where uh, Paul and, and Barnabas are preaching, and uh, the, the people there take them to be two gods. They said this is uh, Zeus and Hermes, and, and they brought their animals to make sacrifices to them. Uh, Paul and Barnabas protested, we are only men, don't do this. Uh, but despite their protests, uh, they could not prevent the people from offering their sacrifices. Uh, so in, in that environment, once the message of Jesus was being preached, uh, people exaggerated the status of Jesus. Uh, in, in the Old Testament, this is another uh, aspect of it, thinking more closely within the Jewish perspective, 
uh, in that Jewish environment, to speak of uh, uh, someone as the son of God could mean that he is beloved of God. And of course, there are many persons who are in the Old Testament, the sons of God. Uh, there are also indications uh, that there are heavenly beings who are called sons of God, for example, in the book of Job. Um, so in that uh, circumstance, uh, when a Caesar, on the one hand, was hailed by uh, the Greco-Romans uh, as the uh, as the son of God, um, you know, what was the counter from, from those who wanted to champion Jesus? Like if, you know, Caesar was said to be great in this way, can we say something comparable about Jesus? So uh, naturally, uh, followers of Jesus seized upon the title son of God, um, which uh, for them would not have compromised their monotheism. And, uh, uh, and at least they had something to say about Jesus. But soon enough, that title, Son of God, can be misunderstood. Uh, if A further factor, Sam, I believe, is that now it is uh, becoming more um, to the fore of academic discussions that in that environment, what we are calling monotheism now is not uh, the way in which they define monotheism then. Nowadays, in Jewish monotheism and Islamic monotheism, uh, and even when Christians think of monotheism, they think of a clear line of distinction between God and his creatures. Mm -hmm. uh, but in, in that environment, in that milieu, the, the distinction was not so clearly drawn. Uh, as Frank McGrath, uh, or James, 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 McGrath McGrath. In his, uh, James McGrath in his book, The Only True God, uh, points out, uh, it, it eventually the line was drawn by, by Jews uh, to... Uh, have God on one side and everything else on the other side. Uh, but Christians drew the line differently to include Jesus on the God side. Uh, and, and this is one of the, the key um, ways in which uh, Trinitarianism developed, because once Jesus was included on the God side, it started to look like uh, we have two gods, but Christians knew that they couldn't have two gods. And so what developed is a sort of binitarianism. Jesus and the Father are somehow a one God. And, and different explanations arose as to how exactly they could be one and yet be two. And eventually, the Holy Spirit was included uh, as well as, as a third distinct uh, person, and, and hence the uh, full blossoming of the Trinity. But this took a few hundred years, um, culminating in the uh, Chalcedonian uh, the Council of Chalcedon in the year 451 AD. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think I, I think that's exactly right. I, I don't really uh, disagree with, with any of what you said. That it was that it was easy and almost too slippery of a slope, uh, especially because Christianity, of course, it started out within Judaism, but in not very long, Gentiles far outnumbered um, Jews in their own movement. And that it was, um, and well, it's certainly true that Christianity maintained a lot of its Jewishness in many ways, that I think with regards to the subject of the identity of Jesus and his relationship to God, that too many pagan ideas were, and concepts were used to imagine how exactly that worked out. But it's, the, the path to the Trinity is also kind of slow, right? There, it's not like there were no Trinitarians and then like someone's like, hey, the Trinity, and then everyone's like, great idea, and then all of a sudden it was Trinitarian. It, it was almost so many small little steps that are kind of hard to notice over time that kind of, it's, it's, exact, it's a little bit hard to say exactly when belief in the full-blown Trinity started, because you have to be very careful about how you define it, because depending on how you find it, maybe you'll get an answer in like, the 200s AD, or maybe you'll get an answer in the 300s or the 400s, or maybe you'll get an answer in the Protestant Reformation, you know, depending on how uh, precisely you define the Trinity. So it, I, I think that that is a, a, a very accurate uh, explanation. So in many of your debates with Trinitarians, what are sort of some of their main arguments that they use um, that you're, you're most familiar with and that you've encountered often? Uh, most often, appeal, to, uh, appeal is made to the Gospel of John and uh, to the writings of Paul and, and uh, to the epistle to the Hebrews. Um, uh, for, so appealing to uh, John's Gospel, um, frequent reference would be made to John chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. 
Um, uh, John chapter eight, verse 58, before Abraham was, I am, um, uh, and, and so on. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, uh, frequently reference is made to John chapter 20, verse 28, where um, uh, Thomas says, my Lord and my God, uh, speaking to Jesus. Mm -hmm. uh, to the um, coming to the Pauline epistles, uh, a frequent reference would be made to the Carmen Christi in um, Philippians chapter two, verses uh, six and, and onwards, where we have this sort of uh, uh, being from above that comes down uh, onto earth, taking on the form of a servant, and uh, and then God exalts this this person, and this is. It turns out that this is a representation of Jesus. Uh, frequent reference is made to the letter to the Hebrews, uh, uh, chapter one, where uh, Jesus is uh, apparently being addressed by God using the 45th Psalm, in which we have the words, thy throne, O God. Mm -hmm. um, in, and, and the point is advanced that here, clearly Jesus is called God uh, by no less than God himself. Um, and I'm, yeah, well, exactly how that works out, but <laughs> yeah. And, and may I add that uh, frequent reference is made also to the book of uh, Revelation, uh, mm -hmm. where Jesus is said to uh, bear the titles of Alpha and Omega, uh, the beginning and the, and the end. Um, and of course, if we expand that, just to be fair to uh, Trinitarian arguments, you know, sometimes reference is even made uh, to uh, Matthew's gospel, where it says, go and baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And uh, the argument is advanced that here, the three seem to bear a singular name. And a reference is sometimes made to, John, to, to Mark's gospel, uh, where um, in, in Mark chapter one, uh, verses from the Old Testament that uh, clearly refer to Yahweh are apparently now brought into service uh, to refer to Jesus as if Jesus is Yahweh. And uh, so putting it all, all together, you know, many Trinitarians are convinced that their Bible uh, from beginning to end um, uh, teach the Trinitarian doctrine. And if we point out that, well, wait a minute, Jews did not have this uh, belief, uh, they are willing to go into the Old Testament and find passages like uh, Genesis uh, chapter 1, verse 26, let us make man in our image. They point to the, tar to the fact that um, uh, they, they say that Echad, when it says uh, Yahweh, Yahweh, uh, Yahweh Eloheinu, Yahweh Echad, uh, Echad there, uh, Yahweh is our God, Yahweh is one. They say that the one there, Echad, in Hebrew is a compound uh, one. And uh, they are willing to point to Genesis chapter 19, verse 24, uh, where it says that, uh, uh, you know, Yahweh rained down uh, the, uh, was it stones? Yeah, fire from, from heaven. Fire yeah. from, from, from Yahweh in heaven. Yeah. Uh, so it looks like there's a Yahweh here on earth and there's another Yahweh up in, up in heaven. We have at least, at least two Yahwehs. And so the argument continues. I hope that in, in what I've presented so far, uh, one would not clip that out and, and say, here Shavir is, is, here's Shavir's argument for the Trinity. Uh, but, you know, I, I've tried to give a fair representation. Yeah, I uh, thought, of, I thought uh, that was more than fair. And I'm, I, I'm very impressed that that, that was, uh, I think you hit all of the main textual passages uh, correctly. Um, so that's sort of like a, a scriptural argument. Are there ever sort of, you know, philosophical or other sort of reason-based arguments that, that you might get um, presented with? Yeah, uh, sometimes, uh, and very often, in fact, uh, one would, uh, you know, some uh, Trinitarians would say that, uh, you know, God is love, and, and the only way God could have been uh, loving from all eternity is if there were these three persons in the Trinity uh, loving each other. If God was alone, then there would have been no one to love. Um, uh, I, recently, in my in my debate with Matt Slick, uh, mm -hmm. I was surprised because he came up with two additional arguments which I hadn't uh, considered before, or, or or rather I hadn't heard it before. Um, uh, one was um, that if God was alone before creating everything else, well then he would have been uh, quite lonely and to the mm -hmm. point of be, that being torturous. And uh, secondly, he he said that there is That's this universal. Yeah. There, there is this old. <laughs> he said there is this old problem um, that philosophers have discussed uh, for eons, um, the, the problem of the one and the many. And um, 
uh, by, by positing that God is one and many at the same time, at least three, well, just three, one and three at the same time, that he's a unity and a diversity, uh, that is an answer to the problem of the one and the many. So since, since my debate with him maybe a couple of weeks ago, I've been uh, doing some research on, on these questions as well. And uh, you know, if you're interested, you know, I can discuss uh, what what I think um, is at issue here. Sure. So, so what, from your perspective, what do you think is? How do you understand the New Testament, and what do you think that it teaches about Jesus and and Jesus's relationship to God and God's oneness and and those questions? Mm -hmm. Now, uh, James Dunn wrote uh, among his many writings. There's an interesting book called Unity. Uh, in diversity, something of this nature. That's in the title, but it's about mm -hmm. the New Testament. It's about the New Testament having a sort of unity and also diversity. Uh, I think this is a very uh, useful paradigm for understanding the New Testament. Yes, uh, there, there, there are some unified themes and ideas and, and uh, presentations of Jesus and so on, uh, but also we can see a diversity in, in, in among the writers of the New Testament, what they believe, how they present Jesus, and so on. Uh, so a very important part of that, I think, is the way in which Jesus is presented in the four Gospels. If, if, and nowadays, most scholars uh, believe that Mark was the first of the four Gospels to be written, and, and that John was the last of the four. If we, if we compare Mark with John, we will see that there is a lot of development of ideas between Mark and, and John. Uh, so John, for example, is the only one of the four Gospels that presents Jesus as the Logos of God, um, and, and very prominently so, right in the in the very beginning of this uh, Gospel. Um, you know, this is the Logos that was existent with God from the very beginning. Uh, he is uh, somewhat divine, it would seem, and he came down onto earth. He is the one through which everything was created. Nothing was created uh, uh, except through him, uh, and so on. Um, uh, but we can see this in individual stories as well. So, for example, in the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, we have Jesus praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he's asking the Father to let this cup pass from him. Uh, but uh, in, in John's Gospel, he doesn't pray like that. In fact, uh, the, the, the whole scenery is different. But what is interesting is that when John, uh, uh, John has it, that when Jesus enters Jerusalem, he says, now my hour has come, and what shall I pray? Father, save me from this hour? Uh, no, it is for this reason that I came to this hour. The wording is something of this nature, uh, close to the New International Version rendering of this verse. So it, it seems that in, in the synoptics, he's saying, now my hour has come. Father, save me from this hour. In John's gospel, he's saying, now my hour has come. Should I pray, save me from this hour? No, because I came for this hour. Uh, so in John's gospel, Jesus is represented as this uh, pre-existent figure who comes deliberately into the world to fulfill a certain function. And, and John's gospel has it that uh, John the Baptist proclaims him uh, right away as the lamb who takes away the sin of the world. Uh, whereas in Matthew's gospel, John the Baptist is sending his disciples to Jesus to find out if he's the one who is to come or shall we wait for another. Uh, so, so we see a kind of development of ideas about Jesus uh, as we go from um, from, from Mark to, to John. John has a, a different representation. We see a similar representation uh, that, that we find in John's gospel in, in, Mark, in, in Paul's writings, though Paul uses different terms. So for John, Jesus is the logos of God. In, in Paul's writings, Jesus is the wisdom of God, the Sophia. And, um, but, but for Paul as well, Jesus is an exalted uh, figure. So it seems to me that what may have happened, Sam, and uh, of course I'm I'm not uh, you know the the uh, I'm 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 not a biblical scholar by profession. So there are sure. biblical scholars out there to you know to whom I defer. But uh, in my humble um, uh, attempt to put this all together, uh, it seems to me that uh, Paul proclaimed this heavenly Christ come down to earth, and uh, uh, the the gospel writers are dealing with actual stories of Jesus on the ground. So Paul has the theoretical idea about Jesus and his high position. The gospel writers are dealing with the facts on the ground, trying to represent the stories as they are. And in these stories, it is clear, as, as we see in the synoptics, that people don't know who Jesus is. 
Uh, some say he is one of the prophets. Some say he is uh, um, John the Baptist even, even though John the Baptist by this time was, uh, had long been beheaded. Uh, but, but people are, are, are positing that he is some human figure uh, well into the story in the middle of Mark's gospel, chapter eight. Uh, uh, but, so they're dealing with the facts of the ground of, as to how Jesus was perceived. And then we have a, a later representation of Jesus uh, it, that, that does not pay attention to the facts of the, on the ground. That's Paul's idea. And then we come to John's gospel, which tries to bridge the two, uh, dealing with the facts on the ground, but uh, in a way, uh, molding those facts so that they fit that high Christology that we already know from Paul's uh, writings. Sure, interesting, yeah. And, and I, I don't mean this as any sort of criticism at all, but that is actually a pretty good summary of a lot of scholarly opinion. A lot of, I, I can see how, you know, reading, I don't know, N.T. Wright, Richard Bauckham, and a bunch of other New Testament scholars kind of, and also combined with some skeptical scholars like Bart Ehrman and stuff like that, that is actually uh, sort of in, in the waters. And I, I think that you summarized that synopsis pretty well. Of course, I, I slightly disagree, <laughs> but um, I, just to explain sort of my position a little bit, I, you're, you're sort of positing that there's some disagreement within the New Testament itself, that, that perhaps there's this sort of human Christology of people who are more connected with the oral tradition and perhaps, you know, even personally related to the historical Jesus on the ground. There's people like Paul who are sort of theologizing reports about Jesus and kind of turning it into a little bit more, I don't know, mythical theological Jesus. And then, and then John bridging them together somehow. And I think that, um, well, I, I guess I could talk briefly about how I understand John 1, and I'd be curious on how, how you kind of um, hear this and how this makes sense to you. But I don't one-to-one -one equate um, the word with Jesus, I guess, would be one way of putting it. And that I view when when John's talking about the logos or the logos or however your preferred way of pronouncing that is that it's it's like a divine attribute, sort of like how Lady Wisdom can be personified in Proverbs eight or something like that. And honestly, I, I suspect that's not too different from the way a Muslim would think about um, uh, God's wisdom or God's reasoning or God's knowledge and stuff like that. And that. Like saying that Jesus is the word become flesh is sort of like saying Jesus is sort of like God's wisdom embodied in a person or God's promises come to fruition or um, God's, you know, commandments lived out perfectly in a human life, something like that. I've heard, I've actually heard some Muslims before say something like Muhammad is sort of like a living, walking and breathing Quran or mm. something like that. Yes. And like, if you call the Quran, the word of God, that's not that different from what I'm trying to say. I'm sort of like saying Jesus is a living, breathing, walking, you know, uh, representation of God's word or, or something like that. Um, yeah, it's interesting that you have that perspective. And uh, that, that reminds me of a problem that often comes up in, uh, in our discourse with uh, Trinitarians. Uh, some people do not define their terms uh, very well, and, and they do not stick to the definitions. So first yeah. of all, they are vague to begin with, and secondly, they equivocate between meanings. Yes. So one moment, the, the, the you know Jesus refers to the human uh, person that was walking in in, in Nazareth, and uh, the uh, the next moment they're talking about a divine person. So one moment, the, the logos is the, that which is in heaven. The next moment, the logos is that which is this person here on earth and, and so on. So they, they, they're not so very clear and consistent in, in what, they, what they mean. But mm -hmm. it's good that, to, to hear that you have that uh, metaphorical sort of interpretation of, uh, uh, of, yeah. of the logos. And I, I think that the Gospel of John also has a lot of language of the sort of you know, sent from heaven, from above, you know, came to you from God, like, you know, that sort of stuff that seems like it's saying, well, okay, Jesus was up there with God, and then he got beamed down here, and then he was here for a while, and then he returned from where he came from. Um, but I, I think that, I think that there was sort of a, a, a Jewish way of talking, a Jewish idiom, that's sort of like, 
you know, the, the whole point of the Gospel of John, and he says this at the end, I have written these things so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you might have life in his name, right? You know, that, that's a strange purpose statement for someone who's trying to prove to you that Jesus is a deity or the one true God or something like that. Mm -hmm. And yes. that I think that the language of heaven from heaven, like, uh, you know, Christians and Muslims will have a debate about whether Muhammad was a true prophet, right? That, um, and that I think one of the ways that you could phrase that is, are you saying that Muhammad was from heaven or was he of earth, right? Mm -hmm. But that's not a way of saying, did Muhammad pre-exist up there in the heavenly realm and then get sent down and then go back or something like that? Uh, because there's a question that Jesus asks, it's not in the Gospel of John, it's in one of the synoptics where he says, um, the baptism of John the Baptist, was it from heaven or was it of men? right? And they are like, oh, shoot, if we say it's uh, of men, lots of people like John the Baptist, and they'll be mad at us. But if we say it's of heaven, then he'll trick us in another way. So we're just not going to answer. But Jesus is, he's not saying, did John the Baptist come from heaven? Or did the water that he's baptizing with you come from heaven instead of a river or something like that? He's, mm -hmm. he's, he's using an idiom for saying, is he doing things in a way that is authorized by God and empowered by God, or is he doing it on his own authority, right? Mm -hmm. And we, we understand that idiom when we hear it that way, but I think because of Trinitarian theology, we're so preconditioned to hear those sorts of statements when they're said about Jesus in the Gospel of John and some sort of more, I don't know, uh, ontological, uh, metaphysical way, as opposed to a way of talking, because the whole purpose of the Gospel of John is, is he the Messiah that was sent by God, or is he not, right? It's sort of like you can imagine Jews and Christians arguing over whether Jesus is the Messiah is similar to Christians and Muslims or arguing over whether Muhammad was a prophet sent by God or sent of his own initiative or something like that. Mm -hmm. And that's what that language is supposed to communicate, but it, get, it gets misunderstood. So, so that's how I would that's how I would sort of explain the Gospel of John and how how biblical Unitarians understand and read the Gospel of John. Yeah, I appreciate that that way of interpreting the Gospel, and and I I really uh, want to highlight the um, the purpose statement that you drew attention to when John says, "I've written all of this that you may know that Jesus is the Son of God, and that uh, believing in Him you may have life in His name." So, if you wanted to. To, if his whole purpose of the gospel is to um, show that Jesus is God, this would be the understatement of the year because, yeah. you know, the son of someone is not the same as the someone. Uh, I mean, almost universally until you adopt a Trinitarian uh, framework of putting all of these. So it's like all of the gospel writings are being stuffed into this Trinitarian paradigm and force fitted to mean Trinity, whereas the plain sense is something else. And um, uh, th that should also tie in with our discussion about the logos, which you have uh, a metaphorical interpretation of. But if somebody takes the literal interpretation that Jesus is the logos, and you know this is God's reason somehow, and this was uh, a second person of the Holy Trinity, uh, again, why would Jesus? Why would John not summarize his gospel by saying, uh, and in summary, what I've been trying to tell you is that Jesus is the logos of God who came, created the world. But then he came down. He's consubstantial with the Father, co-eternal, yeah, exactly. eternally generated, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. yeah. So that would have been a fitting summary statement if he meant logos in that literal way. Unless, of course, as some scholars think, the the prologue to John's Gospel, John one one to one eighteen, uh, perhaps uh, was appended to this gospel in the last stages of its uh, composition and uh, editing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and what I would point to kind of an answer to that, I think that the prologue of, of John is clearly poetic. It's clearly um, exalted, you know, um, meaningful language um, that, that's in like a poetic register. And then it sort of switches to narrative after that. It's sort of like a, a dramatic introduction. And the, the easiest language to misunderstand and to misapply is poetic language. Poetic language is easier to misinterpret than kind of more, I don't know, literal or more narrative sort of language like the rest of the gospel. And I think it's a mistake to interpret the rest of the gospel, which is pretty clear because, you know, Trinitarians, 
they like the gospel of john until they don't some of the hardest verses for them are in the gospel of john like when john says you uh, this is eternal life that they may know you the only true god and jesus whom you have sent which is you know very similar to like the muslim shahada really uh in, in certain ways and jesus says uh, you know, why do you seek to kill me? I am a man who told you what I heard from God, you know, and, and and those sorts of things. In fact, the Gospel of John calls Jesus a man, an anthropos, more than all of the three synoptic Gospels put together, right? <laughs> uh, so there, there, and he, to, there's chapters where he's just emphatic, I'm not doing this on my own authority, I'm only doing what my father told me to do. I don't judge anyone. My father judges people. I don't speak my own words. I speak my father's words, you know, right? There's all that, that like half of the gospel of John is Jesus trying, this isn't me that's doing this. This is God working through me. And you need to believe that, right? Uh, and and so I, I think that that emphasis in the gospel of John is clear. And, you know, I, it would take too long to repeat all of those verses. But then the prologue gets kind of, misinterpreted and swamped over all of those other clear things throughout the rest of the gospel is how I would sort of explain it. Yeah, and of course, as you know, Trinitarians will come back at you and say, well, you know what, Sam, all of these uh, passages that refer to Jesus as Anthropos, we're not denying, wait a minute, hey, hello, we believe that he was a man as well, but they say that, you know, he was man and God at the same time. But in order to do that, they're, they're assuming uh, a paradigm which actually is not really dictated by the verses of the scripture. Uh, mm -hmm. they, they come at that paradigm from outside of the scripture and they try to force fit the scripture into that paradigm. And, and it's not a paradigm that, that makes sense to say that uh, a human being walking on the earth is also fully God at the same time, as well as being fully man. Uh, it, it really doesn't work. Uh, I've been asking um, uh, Trinitarians to uh, tell me if you feel that, that Jesus had two minds, because uh, he would have to have the mind of a man for him to be fully man. And he would have to have a, the mind of God to be fully God. And the two minds have to be separate. You cannot have a, a conflated mind. Because if the human mind has any inkling that he is actually God, then he wouldn't be like the rest of us, as, as the book, book of Hebrews says, like us in every other way, in every way apart from sin. Right. Is the book of Hebrews that says that? That is the Hebrews, that is Hebrews yeah. that says that. And yeah. uh, so, and, and, you know, when I ask about this, uh, you know, sometimes they, if, uh, they they act as if they haven't heard me. They're starting to talk about the will, but I didn't ask about the will. I was asking about the mind. Mm -hmm. um, so so that I think is a very important uh, consideration. The the other thing I wanted to say about this Sam is that uh, they will say that you know of course Jesus can say all of these things because as you said you know I only speak the Father's words and all of that. I only do as I'm commanded. They say this is kenosis. This is Jesus. Uh, emptying himself of uh, the divine prerogatives. He's here in the form of a servant, but he's still divine. Uh, but uh, as, as one of the Unitarian writers, uh, William Ellery Channing pointed mm -hmm. out yeah. mm -hmm. in, in an old book that I happened to find in a used bookshop, uh, he says, uh, tell us where in the scripture does it say that Jesus is doing ABC as a man and XYZ as God? Like th there is no such distinction in, this, in the scripture. You're just making that all up. And again, they're, they're making up something fantastic and force-fitting the Gospels to uh, fit into that paradigm. Whereas the simple explanation for all of the, uh, you know, when, when Jesus uh, sh shows his subordination to God, that is natural, he's a human being. Uh, when he speaks uh, with uh, some um, exalted prerogatives, uh, he's obviously speaking as a messenger of God, as one commissioned by God, authorized by God, uh, to do or say certain uh, things on God's behalf. So that, that's a simple paradigm. It doesn't lead to any kind of uh, contradiction of saying that uh, this one person was perfect and imperfect at the same time, and that, you know, he was God, and then he came down onto earth. Because if, if that's the argument, Sam, how do I know that you're not God? Because mm -hmm. if I point to point out the obvious that you're a human being, or you can say, well, wait a minute, I was God, but I took the form of a human being. Right. And There's seemingly nothing that Jesus could say as a man to convince you that he weren't also God. He could say, that's right. I am not God. And they'd be like, well, that's his human nature talking. Exactly. So, then, exactly. You know, that, there's no, <laughs> and if it is that unfalsifiable, then it, that, that points to some trouble with the, the theory itself as a coherent idea. Exactly, exactly.
Mm -hmm. So, um, and I, I feel kind of obligated to briefly address Philippians 2 also. Um, the, uh, let's see here, like the first sentence where it says, in the form of God existing, right? That's actually in the present tense is a, a thing that a lot of people don't notice. And so I think that that describes sort of Jesus's exalted and glorified nature. Like we could talk about, you know, I, I'm, I will admit that the, the New Testament calls Jesus God or in the form of God a little bit, but I don't think they mean what most people think. It's, a, it's, a, it's basically like saying divine, and I don't really think that, or of a godly quality. And I think that it's describing sort of Jesus's status in heaven. Like it says, who in the form of God existing present, like Jesus up in heaven now, because Paul believes in a very strong exaltation of Jesus, right? Jesus gets highly exalted. That's in that same passage, right? So Jesus, it, it, to get highly exalted, you have to have been lower than your exalted state at some point. And that the who did not consider equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself and, you know, form a servant and all that, that's describing his human life on earth, not his um, deciding to become, you know, a human when previously he was something other than a human, and that it it fits with the passage because uh, Paul Paul in that passage is basically saying, you know, hey everyone, be humble, um, treat each other as more important than yourselves, cooperate with each other, that sort of thing. Be like Jesus who decided to incarnate himself as a lower form of being. Well, you know, the, his audience can't incarnate themselves as a lower form of being. They can't become snails to preach the gospel to snail kind or something like that and empty themselves of humanity. But they can choose to live a humble life and to be even willing to sacrifice for each other to the point of death, right? Mm -hmm. That actually, if that's the moral lesson, and that's what Jesus did in his earthly life, it makes much more sense if it's talking about Jesus's earthly life. And the reason why it says in the form of God is that's that's kind of the light at the end of the tunnel that Christians have to look forward to, right? The the God the uh, second Peter says that you know Christians will participate in the divine nature in heaven, right? As a you know at participate in the fusos theos, right? The the form the the nature of God. So that's describing that future state that Christians have to look forward to. It doesn't mean that Christians in heaven become members of the Trinity. It's just saying that, you know, you're immortal, you're glorified, you're, you have a certain moral excellence to you that's reminiscent of God's own moral excellence and things like that. So mm -hmm. that, that's, how I, that's how I would describe Philippians 2. Because other than that, there's no other passage in Paul where he talks about Jesus previously having been something like in heaven and then now currently being a human being. There's no other passage. And again, Philippians 2 is also a poem. So if you're taking a poem to base your entire theology out of the Apostle of Paul, you're on shaky ground compared to the times where he's talking clearly, not using poetic language. So be very careful if, the, if your theology is based off of one single poem at the expense of all the other clear sayings of Paul throughout the rest of his letters. Yeah, and what might be added here, Sam, is that, you know, you can't take Philippians 2 uh, out of the whole Philippians letter and, and away from the rest of Paul's writings. What is clear in, in, is that Philippians begins and ends with doxology, which, uh, you know, is praise of God in distinction of, uh, you know, from yes. Jesus. Yes. So, you know, Paul is mentioning praise be to God our Father. And, uh, you know, something about Jesus uh, or about Christ. So why, why, if you're speaking about uh, two entities in the same breath, why would you call one God and, and not call the other one God? You know, I mean, if Trinitarianism was true, uh, then Paul should have said, uh, you know, praise be to the first person of the Trinity, the second person of the Trinity, the third person of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, something of this nature. But he's, he's saying God and Christ. So yeah. God refers in, obviously to God. And some of his letters, he opens up, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Exactly. Right? exactly. So, so God is the God of Jesus. It's not just God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ, which a Trinitarian could be like, okay, you know, he's just phrasing it that way. Yeah. But if God is not only separate from Jesus, but Jesus's own God, God can't have his own God. <laughs> you, you know, the, yes. so and there there are numerous passages, including in the Gospel of John, where Jesus calls God his own God. 
Mm -hmm. uh, so, and, and where other people say that God was Jesus's God. So that, that's just, a, you know, you can only do the, well, he's talking in his human nature. So it's his divine nature, the God of his human nature. You know, it, it just doesn't, there's just no real good answer for that at the end of the day. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And another thing that I feel like I, I, I'm, I'm hogging the mic a little bit. I'm going to switch no, uh, to you. I, bit, I learned but... by listening to you as well. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I'll, I'll say that another thing that, that I feel like is really important to Unitarian Christians that sort of gets lost in Trinitarian Christianity is, is that Jesus is a moral exemplar of what it means to be a man who is faithful to God and has faith in God right? Jesus isn't just a moral example as God walking around, but he's an example of what it means to be a man who has faith in God, right? When Jesus is tempted by Satan, he says, you know, you shall love the Lord your God, you shall, uh, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve, right? He is declining to bow down to Satan and reminding Satan and himself that the proper person to worship is God. And he's not talking about himself as best I can tell. Exactly, exactly. And, and Jesus, when he's a human being, he participates in the temple. He goes to the temple as a boy. He goes to the temple as an adult. And what's he doing there? He's worshiping God. And, and Jesus is the high priest forever, as it says in the book of Hebrews. So what does a high priest do? The high priest's job is to help everyone worship God. So he's doing that in heaven now for eternity. Is he? Mm -hmm. le he's leading the congregation in the worship of God, for now and for always. So, um, you know how exactly God can worship Himself, or how exactly that's supposed to all work out. I, I, I've never gotten a satisfactory answer. I'll just put it that way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so you know, there are a lot of um, very uh, uh, good points against the Trinitarian doctrine, and uh, it, it's still it's very surprising that. Uh, you know, people are still rising to the fore to defend the Trinitarian doctrine. And, um, you know, we, we just pray that God will guide us all, uh, us and them, to, to that truth that he wants us to accept for our salvation. Sure. So, so now I have, I have a couple more questions um, for you. So um, what, what do Muslims believe about Jesus and, and how does that relate to this conversation? Hmm. So uh, the Quran speaks highly of Jesus. The Quran, which Muslims believe to be the word of God, um, uh, mentions Jesus by name 25 times. Uh, there are two chapters out of the 114 chapters of the Quran that mention Jesus so prominently that uh, uh, the names of the, of the chapters are, are uh, you know, named after uh, persons connected with Jesus. For example, in the 19th chapter, uh, is named uh, Maryam, which in Arabic is the equivalent of Miriam, uh, the Hebrew, and Mary mm -hmm. in English. Uh, and there we have a detailed story about the angel coming to Mary, giving her the news of the birth of her child. She says, you know, how can I have a child? Um, because uh, no, no mortal has touched her. And uh, we have a similar story in the third chapter of the Quran. And that third chapter is called Ali Imran, which means the family of uh, Imran. And Imran is given... Uh, in this narrative as the, the grandfather of Jesus. Uh, so in, in all of the references to Jesus in the Quran, we do not find anything uh, reflecting negatively on him, unless someone says, well, wait a minute, the Quran doesn't uh, accept that he's God, or the Quran doesn't accept that he died for our sins. But apart from that, uh, the Quran speaks very highly of Jesus, speaks about his miracles, even mentioning some miracles of Jesus that are not detailed in the New Testament, um, the Quran says that Jesus raised the dead from uh, back to life, healed the leper, cured uh, the blind, and, and so on. Um, and uh, as the, the Quran's narrative has been interpreted by Muslims to mean that Jesus was uh, born of a virgin mother. Uh, and there is a passage in the Quran which has been interpreted by Muslims as well as indicating that Jesus will return uh, for a final advent. Uh, so, so there's a lot in the Quran about Jesus, uh, to the extent that uh, Sidney Griffith, in his book, The Bible in Arabic, uh, presents the Quran as a kind of reworking of the Bible uh, for its own purposes. And uh, Sidney Griffith uh, says that there is a high quotient of biblical knowledge in the Quran. Uh, and that's in general, but he speaks also specifically about Mary and Jesus and how they are represented in the Quran. This does not come 
uh, from uh, someone trying to put pieces together based on stories that were heard in the environment, uh, but it reflects a very high and detailed knowledge of, uh, of the biblical narrative. Mm -hmm. And um, does the Quran also call Jesus the Messiah? Yes, yes. The title mm -hmm. Messiah is given for Jesus in the Quran, in the Arabic ver version, Masih. Uh, and uh, some Muslim commentators try to evaluate this term uh, based on its Arabic etymology. But it seems uh, that the best way of uh, elucidating this is to say that it, it is the equivalent of the Hebrew Hamashiach, the Messiah. Mm -hmm. And so does the, the Quran give much content as to what Messiah means, what that title is, and, and, and what, what his status is as the Messiah? No, no, it doesn't. And this is why the Muslim scholars try to, um, you know, understand the term from its etymological, uh, etymological, etymological roots. Uh, I should drink something as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the Quran does not say what Messiah means. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, we know, and, and you know from, from the Hebrew, that Messiah in the Old Testament was a title uh, given to somebody who was uh, designated to serve God in, in office, uh, either mm -hmm. as a judge uh, or a king. So we might say that Jesus was specifically designated uh, to serve God in, in a very uh, meaningful way. Mm -hmm. How do different um, Muslim traditions sort of, I guess, maybe elaborate on that or fill out that picture a little bit? Um, some some uh, Muslim um, scholars, uh, you know, started with the etymology. They say that uh, masaha in Arabic means to anoint. Uh, so they got it right in that way. But yeah. they thought that so it still uh, they, means that even in Arabic, the the root yes, of the word still it, has a, a, an anointing. Yeah. Yes. It it but it also has the meaning of to touch. So um, so they they thought that uh, maybe G because Jesus healed with his touch, that's why he's called this. So, mm -hmm. it, it, you know, the, the commentators on the Quran um, did not have such detailed knowledge of the biblical narratives. And so sometimes they try to explain things uh, by imagining how it could be so. Or maybe they heard some stories from others and they tried to piece it together to elaborate mm -hmm. the, the, the Quranic narrative. Yeah, I think most Christians do not know that, the, that Muslims will say that Jesus was a prophet, they did miracles, that he was born of a virgin, and that he's the Messiah in, in some sense. I, I think that that, that that's still surprises most Christians to learn that. Um, so, but what does the Quran say about crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus? So the Quran doesn't say much about it. There is, there is uh, uh, one particular verse that, that comes to the crux of the matter, if I yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, that's in uh, Surah 4, verse 157, uh, which uh, it says in Arabic, mm -hmm. They killed him not, nor did they crucify him, but so he was made to appear to them, or so it was made to appear uh, to them. I'm uh, equivocating between the it and he, because uh, the, the Hebrew pronoun who in Arabic can, can refer either to an impersonal it mm -hmm. or to uh, a person, he. Uh, so if it refers to, refers to a he, then it would mean that Jesus appeared to them such um, as if they killed him. Uh, if it uh, refers to the impersonal it, it may mean that the situation appeared to them like that. Um, it, the classical Muslim commentators on the Quran almost uh, unanimously uh, said that uh, this verse means uh, that someone else was made to look like Jesus and put on the cross instead of Jesus, uh, whereas Jesus had been raised up into heaven alive by God. Um, uh, but modern commentators, uh, including myself, uh, are, are more inclined to say that the verse is not denying that Jesus was put on the cross, uh, but it has some other, some other meaning. Um, and some uh, non-Muslim commentators, Jeffrey Parander, a Christian in his book, Jesus in the Quran, uh, suggests that uh, it, the Quran is technically correct because uh, it, you know, it's denying that the Jews killed Jesus. And, and that is factually right because it was the Romans who killed him by crucifixion. It was a Roman form of execution. Uh, it was not the Jews who did this. Um, 
uh, but, uh, and some, some uh, might even argue that the, the Quran is not denying the entire gospel narrative uh, or uh, at all, or, or rather to put it a different way, the Quran is accepting the gospel narratives as they are, uh, but is trying to put a divine uh, coloring on it to show that, well, mm -hmm. you know, the, the people on the ground thought that they were killing the man of God, but they could not have the upper hand over the man of God. It is not they who did this, but it's God who did this. And so, so God mm -hmm. organized this entire event for God's own purposes, and uh, and and God has the upper hand here. Yeah, uh, and they will tie that in with other verses of the of the Quran. That's in my a, own humble, I, oh, go ahead, go ahead. Hmm. I was going to say, Sam, to wrap it up, that uh, my, in my own humble um, attempt to put all the pieces together from the Quran, from the Gospels, uh, knowing history and so on, or knowing the little that I feel I know about history, uh, I would say that what the Quran is uh, is alluding to is that. Uh, it, it, or to put it in a different way, if I posit the idea that Jesus was actually put on the cross, but he did not die on the cross, that he was taken down alive, and then perhaps from his tomb, he was translated into heaven, then to me, all of the verses of the Quran make sense in, in the light of that uh, paradigm. Now, here too, I've adopted a paradigm. Um, and I've previously blamed Trinitarians for adopting a paradigm. Mm -hmm. and, but, but here I am adopting a paradigm because the verses of the Quran are not so clear on the issue. There are many different opinions about it. And uh, secondly, I'm not adopting a paradigm that is inherently incoherent uh, or you know, self-contradictory. Mm -hmm. and, and to me, this makes sense of a lot of the gospel narrative. Uh, it makes sense of uh, why... Pilate was amazed when he learned that Jesus had expired on the cross in Mark's gospel, um, and so on. It makes sense of a lot of things, and uh, it, uh, it's, it makes sense of a lot of Old Testament passages, which are thought to be predictions of, of, these, of this crucifixion event, um, and, and, and so on. It seems to tie in with, with a lot of uh, mm -hmm. factors. So, so you're saying that, that the, the paradigm that makes sense to you is that Jesus was on the cross, but he did not die on the cross. They maybe mistook him as dead when he perhaps still had some life in him and was taken down and then was alive for a little while thereafter, but perhaps trans expired relatively soon, I guess. And then from his tomb, he was taken to, to heaven. Yeah, I don't know if I want to get to the, to the part where, as I said, he expired sometime later. Uh, thinking of God taking him up alive from the tomb would in, in, entail. So he was uh, put in the tomb alive, also. It, that's I what I would yeah. I would posit. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then taken up alive from from the tomb, uh, and that's if we want to account for the empty tomb being being discovered. Um, otherwise, in, in you know um, a, a a shorter narrative might fit the Quranic uh, statements as well. For example, if God vindicated Jesus, uh, he doesn't have to prove it in the eyes of men, it, uh, so long as God knows and informs us that Jesus uh, is beloved to him, and, and he raised Jesus, even in spirit, uh, even if his body perished, uh, to me, that would not go against the Quranic uh, narrative. But in, in, in giving credence to the gospel narrative that shows that the tomb was discovered empty, um, it seems that uh, uh, to incorporate that, it would be best to posit that uh, Jesus was taken up alive from the tomb, and that would uh, explain why his body went missing. Sure. Okay. Um, I, I've talked to Dr. Khalil Andani about this before, who I believe was a, a student of yours at the University of Toronto, and he uh, helped put me in touch with you, so I should give him a, a thank you and a shout out. Um, and my but, thanks to him as well for that. <laughs> Um, and his interpretation of that passage that you're talking about is that um, there was sort of a, a maybe a Jewish boast at the time that, you know, Jesus couldn't have been the Messiah. We killed him, right? We took care of that guy. Uh, so, you know, clearly he's not who the Christians think he is. You know, uh, we're, you know, we triumphed over him. So that show that that puts him in his place, right? Ha ha, those silly Christians. Um, and that the, this Quranic verse is a sort of a refutation of the idea that the Jews and or the Romans were um, killing him against God's will, 
and that it's more that actually sort of like what it says in in Acts, you know, 2.22, men of Israel hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God by with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst. This Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed him by the hands of lawless men, right? So it's sort of like Peter is saying, yes, you killed him, but it was God's plan all along, and that you actually didn't know what you were doing, you were actually accomplishing God's will, and that the, you know, the joke's on you, I guess. Um, and so uh, I wonder what, what you think of that interpretation. So it's not actually yeah. denying the crucifixion. It's denying the fact that the Jews did it as opposed to it being God uh, um, sanct uh, sanctioning it, essentially. Mm. Okay. Of course, Professor uh, Andani is, is his own scholar now. I mean, he is a scholar now, so I can learn from him uh, as well, even if I uh, taught him previously. Um, and so, you know, I'm, I'm open to new ideas and uh, I sometimes watch uh, videos of uh, Professor Andani um, online as well, and, and I benefit from, from hearing his ideas. So this idea about the Jews boasting, this has been uh, uh, widely acknowledged uh, in, in, the, um, in the elaboration of this first nowadays. Ian Mevorak uh, wrote an article in the Journal of uh, Religion. Uh, in which uh, he argued as a Christian that we should appreciate the Quranic narrative from this perspective. Uh, we know from uh, some Talmudic writings that there was a joke, uh, there was a boast among the, the Jews uh, prior to the Prophet Muhammad, uh, on whom be peace, uh, in, in, in which they're, they're saying that they killed this person. They, they sent out uh, heralds to make sure that if anybody had anything to say in defense of Jesus, they should come forward. And uh, eventually they convicted him of uh, perhaps sorcery. And, uh, and then eventually they, they, they hung him on the eve of uh, Passover. Uh, so in, in a way, they're, they're boasting through these writings that we have killed him. And perhaps the import of their boast is to say, if we kill him, then he cannot really be the, the Messiah. Um, because uh, the, one interpretation of Messiah is that uh, if he was uh, to be the, one interpretation of Messiah was that he was to be a king like mm -hmm. his father, David. And uh, if he didn't rule, um, that means he, you know, he was not the true Messiah. And, and Jews are still waiting for the true Messiah to come and to rule and to bring back, you know, bring the kingdom of God as it was in the days of David and so on. Or even better yet, uh, bring, bring in the messianic age at a time when uh, the lions will play with the lambs. So the, the Quran, according to Ian Mavarak, and this I'm hearing the same from you with reference to Professor Khalil al -Nani, um, uh, the, the, according to this uh, interpretation, the Quran is just simply replying uh, to the uh, boast of the Jews and saying, while they're boasting that they killed Jesus, the uh, Messiah, uh, they did not kill him because, in fact, it's not they that actually did it. It's the, it's the Romans mm -hmm. uh, that did it. So that this is uh, one. Uh, and, and plus, the, the, the ones who are making this boast are not the ones anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, like the people who wrote the Talmud, in, you know, uh, mm -hmm. especially Babylonian Talmud uh, in the sixth century, the, these are not the original people who were who were there. So something along these lines. Uh, I must confess, I'm a little bit vague uh, as I speak about that particular aspect right now, uh, but but nonetheless, that's one respectable opinion. Uh, the the other um, opinion that you have mentioned has been advanced by some Christians. Uh, I believe Kenneth Cragg advanced an idea like this one, and these are attempts that have been made by Christians uh, to, among other motives, like to, you know, to truly elucidate the text, uh, but, but there are attempts to say, let's have a dialogue together, let's understand each other, and let's not see the Quran as something very foreign to the Bible. Maybe the Quran means it in this way, and, and maybe Muslims can appreciate the biblical record if they think of their Quran as speaking in, in this way, uh, in which case uh, the Quran might be, might be interpreted as meaning that while the whole crucifixion scene unfolded basically as outlined in the Gospels, uh, it, it's God who was in full control of this whole affair. And God is bringing about his own lessons to people through this whole uh, narrative sequence. So it's not the, the Jews that kill him. 
And in fact, uh, one of my professors from the University of Toronto, uh, Professor Lawson, uh, wrote a book entitled The Crucifixion and the Quran, and, uh, or per The Crucifixion in the Quran. And in that book, he uh, argues at length uh, that the, the Quran has used uh, statements like, for example, you did not throw when you threw, but it was God who threw. Uh, to, to say that even though there is a human agent here on the earth doing an act, it was God who actually did the act, and the human agent did not actually do it. Mm -hmm. Whereas, of, mm -hmm. of course, we would say factually the human agent did it, but the Quran is negating that uh, in order to give us a new dimension on yeah. the same problem. Um, so in and a to give way, glory to God as the, exactly. the ultimate author of the action. Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that that that's interesting. Um, but I guess we should say, uh, am I correct in saying that the vast majority of Muslims throughout time have understood to say that Jesus was was not in fact killed on the cross? Yes, yes, the vast majority of Muslim, I, I mean, the the most classical Muslim scholarship, uh, you know, they uh, mostly wrote the uh, commentaries on the Quran in in Arabic language. And as I consult these Arabic commentaries one after another, I've seen that uh, all, uh, you know, everyone I've checked in Arabic from the classical period, they all uh, maintain the same view that uh, Jesus was not put on the cross even. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it is a modern view, uh, putting many pieces together that helps us to arrive at the conclusion that perhaps he was put on the cross, uh, or at least that the Quran is not denying that, mm -hmm. uh, that he was put on the cross. And um, uh, it, it's best to, to maintain, uh, I think, uh, in conclusion, that he was taken down alive and then translated into heaven. Mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting. Um, so, so what what do um, Muslims in the Quran say about Jesus's status or uh, role or authority in heaven currently? Is he just sort of one of the many lucky people who are there currently, or does he does he have some sort of more important role or or status um, than that? Uh, nothing uh, is indicated in the uh, Quran or Islamic traditions about Jesus' uh, role at the moment. Uh, th there is indication in the uh, Hadith narratives, however, uh, that uh, Jesus will return. There is an inkling of this in the Quran, depending on how the Quran is interpreted. Uh, Surah 4, verse 157, we've already mentioned. Uh, 158 says, says, But God raised him to himself. Uh, and then the next verse, uh, verse 159, says, uh, But there is no uh, person of the book except that will believe in him prior to his death. Um, and, and what does his death refer to? Does it refer to the death of the person of the book, meaning a Jew or a Christian person? Or does it refer to the death of Jesus? Uh, if, if it refers to uh, the death of Jesus, then this would mean uh, to commentators that Jesus will come back uh, to earth a second time, and then eventually he will die. Uh, so, so this, according to some interpreters, speaks of his second uh, sojourn. There's another verse of the Quran. It's in uh, the 43rd chapter of the Quran, the 61st uh, verse, uh, where it says, Wa And he is uh, uh, certainly... A, a knowledge of the hour. I know it doesn't translate doesn't translate so smoothly into English, but try to keep it literal. Uh, so, but then uh, again, we have the ambiguity uh, in in the pronoun uh, he. He is the knowledge of the hour, uh, or could it be it? If it's if it's it, that could have been mm -hmm. in the context, the reference to the Quran itself that brings us knowledge about the day of judgment. But if it is he, then commentators uh, take this as an indication that he, Jesus, uh, coming back a second time, uh, will uh, his very coming back will indicate to us that uh, the day of judgment is uh, imminent. Uh, but but so that's talking about his future role, obviously, mm -hmm. uh, if at all in the Quran, and more clearly in the Hadith, where the Hadith says that he will rule for so many years, uh, often seven years is mentioned. Uh, at which time he will bring about a state of peace. Perhaps the Muslims who narrated uh, these hadiths were influenced by uh, Judeo-Christian concepts of the Messianic age, but nonetheless, this is what is mentioned. And then eventually he will slay the Antichrist, and eventually he will uh, die. Some uh, Muslims also believe that he will marry and have children during this, uh, during this Interesting. period. Interesting. 
Um, yeah. I want to I want to come I, I'm going to circle back on the eschatology stuff because because that's really interesting but before I do that I um like the the New Testament and Christians will make a big deal about Jesus being exalted to the right hand of God Jesus says all authority on heaven and earth has been given to me the book of Hebrews makes it clearly um stated that Jesus has been exalted above the angels Paul says you know he's he is he's more powerful than all the powers and principalities and dominions so that Jesus is basically the most powerful you know person in the universe second to God his father and that he has some sort of I don't know heavenly spiritual authority that's sort of in a, in the process of trink, trickling back down to earth as as um, part of the anticipation of his final return and that that he has, that's why you can cast out demons in his name, right? Because he is now above, you know, angels and demons and all spiritual authorities in, in the hierarchy of heaven, right? He's, he, he's you know, number two in, in, in the whole, whole universe. And, and that's what, you know, being at the right hand of God, you know, means. But is there anything like that in the Quran or in Islamic imagination of, of Jesus' status now? No, not, nothing in the Quran. And um, when you ask about Islamic imagination, that could be very vast. Uh, <laughs> I have not studied this area uh, in its depth, uh, but I have not uh, become aware that, that Muslims imagine a high status for Jesus in his present uh, location. Um, nothing, we, we beyond, generally... nothing beyond a saint or, or some other of the other heroes. Yeah, of course, he's a prophet, which for, yeah. for Muslims is above the status of a saint. A, a mm. saint for a Muslim would be, you know, a righteous person. And a prophet uh, is, you know, uh, rank uh, above the, the uh, is mm. a rank above the, uh, the righteous people. Mm -hmm. A, a prophet it, is one who is selected by God. But it's not like he has some sort of active spiritual role and authority that is being executed from heaven back down to earth like the the new testament also even says that jesus has been in, been put in charge of the holy spirit right which is a, a very important and, and powerful job but but so there there so there's none of of that sort of i don't know cosmic exaltation i, I guess uh no th there's nothing about that but i'm intrigued about what, what verse is it sam if you can educate me here that says that Jesus is put in charge of the Holy Spirit. Oh, um, well, he he said, oh, man. If you I don't wish... know it now, you can send it to me later, please. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll send it to you later. There's a passage okay. in John, I think it's John 14, where he's saying, uh, it's better if I go. Uh, don't cling to me. It's better if I go, because if I go, I will send the Holy Spirit. And then um, I think that um, at the at either the end of Luke or the beginning of Acts, he's also I should have had that I'm a little bit better memorized. But but I can send you some passages where it says sure. that basically Jesus has been given authority over the Holy Spirit. But it's clear that that's something that happens after his earthly life, right? He was filled with the Holy Spirit while he was on earth as a human. But now that he's been exalted to heaven, he's been given authority to send the Holy Spirit with his own authority. But that's an authority that's been given to him from God. But I'll, I'll find some passages for that and, and pass that along to you. Yeah, um, I, I know, Sam, you arranged this interview so you can ask me questions. But if you don't mind, I'm intrigued by the, the, the Unitarian view on, on the Holy sure. Spirit. Uh, do, uh, it was my sense that Unitarians regard the Holy Spirit as uh, a sort of uh, manifestation of God or God's charisma working uh, on, on, on the earth. Uh, am yeah. I correct? In that? Yes. Um, and when I heard you describe um, the Holy Spirit in a couple of your debates, I was like, yep, that sounds right to me. Not like a second person that has its own personality and independence and will apart from God the Father and some sort of co-equal status, but it's like um, just in the same way that uh, at, by analogy, humans have their own spirit. It's kind of like an aspect of them, but it's not like separate or apart from my own identity. I could talk about my soul. I could talk about my spirit. I could talk about my mind. And these are parts of me but or attributes or powers of mind, but they're not somehow distinct from my identity at large. That, that's how I would understand the Holy Spirit. It's the spirit of God right? It's not God the Spirit, it's the Spirit of God. And so when the Holy Spirit is at work, it's like God's empowering presence at work in the world. And specifically, the Holy Spirit seems to work through people most commonly, um, like prophets in the Old Testament, Jesus, of course, and then the 
one of the, the changes of the Christian era is that instead of the Holy Spirit being relatively rare as a gift, you know, only certain prophets or maybe kings, and even then, a lot of times in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit is temporarily given to people, right? It can come upon them and then seemingly leave them, right? I think King Saul is described that way. If I'm wrong, out internet, please correct me, but, you know, that was just <laughs> something off the top of my head. But in the New Testament era, all Christians are, are given the Holy Spirit from, from Christ. And so it, it's something that unites the, the church. But it's not a distinct person in the Godhead, does, I, apart from God the Father, it's God's empowering presence and work in, in the world, specifically, mm -hmm. mostly in humans who have been given the Holy Spirit. Yeah, Sam, uh, how do biblical Unitarians reconcile uh, the, the idea of Jesus having uh, such control of, of the Spirit of God um, if he himself is not God? Um, I guess that God can give power and authority to whom he wills. Mm -hmm. And it's not that Jesus somehow has power over God or something like that. Um, uh, Jesus is perfectly obedient and subordinate to his father, but it is now through Jesus that he dispenses these things, just in the same way that God will judge the world through Jesus. Well, does God judge the world or does Jesus judge the world? Well, yes, but God does it through Jesus because that's whom he's appointed to have that authority and power and role. And in the same way, that's how Jesus can be the one who gives and sends the spirit to Christians upon his exalted status in heaven. Mm -hmm. You can see how Trinitarians will come back at this and say that, uh, you know, Jesus judging the world, uh, like he's doing one of the things that God might have done himself, but he's assigned it to Jesus. Yeah. Uh, but for Jesus to have control over the spirit of God, which uh, from, from, from everything we, else we read, it's like the, the spirit of God is uh, almost a, uh, an extension of God into the world. Yes. Um, so it's anyway, something to think about because sure. we, we know yeah. Trinitarians will, will make a point here. So and, and you know, an Trinitarians aren't wrong about everything. But I, I, another thing that that the, uh, that they get wrong so often that's an answer to so many of their points is that God can work through people. And so then when it says God, you know, did um, did God bring the Hebrews out of slavery in Egypt or did Moses bring the Hebrews out of slavery in Egypt? Well, God did it through Moses, right? Was God reigning on, uh, uh, on his throne in Jerusalem or was David reigning on the throne in Jerusalem? Well, God was reigning through his appointed person, David, right? And et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The Bible talks like that all the time where it attributes an action to God and then it attributes an action to a person. And it's like, so is that person God or, you know, well, no, God is working through them and, and God works through Jesus. But we will probably say in a way that I could see might give, you know, some Muslims the Hebrew jeebies about the even a biblical unitarian will say that jesus is like really really important and powerful and exalted mm -hmm. now even to the extent of being in charge of distributing the holy spirit mm -hmm. well, as and, you know, and Sam, for the record yeah. that's also my answer for why sometimes the holy spirit is called the spirit of christ uh mm -hmm. it be, because it's because you know Jesus is distributing it now. It doesn't mean that it's like, I don't know, some sort of perichoresis or, or, or whatever, but um, that you can see how that phrase would make perfect sense of, of the situation I was describing. Mm. Yeah, I was going to say that, uh, as you probably know, Muslims do not uh, regard the, the New Testament as it is. I mean, generally, there are different views mm. among Muslims, but generally, Muslims do not uh, re regard the, the, the New Testament as being intact, the, the original preaching of Jesus. We think that there's been some modification over time. And uh, one of the ways in which uh, we interpret the, the, um, the New Testament is that when we come to these passages about the Paracletus, where Jesus speaks about sending what is interpreted within the gospel itself as, uh, as the Holy Spirit, John chapter 14, verse 26, mm -hmm. explicitly the Paracletus, the Holy Spirit. Uh, but uh, we, we think that uh, this uh, may have been a reference to another uh, prophet, a human being to oh. come after, after Jesus, yeah. Interesting, mm -hmm. because Jesus is also called the paraclete sometimes. Right? That right. word can be, there's a flexible word. It often mm -hmm. means the Holy Spirit, but that's not the only thing it can mean. Mm. Interesting. I haven't heard that before. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. And I, I guess another example that I could give is um, in the beginning of Revelation, um, John says that he was in the Spirit, 
And while he was in the spirit, you know, God gave a revelation to Jesus and Jesus dispatched an angel to John, who's in the spirit. And then he has the vision that's described in the rest of the book. And so, I mean, first off, that's kind of difficult for a Trinitarian, because why would Jesus receive a revelation upon entering heaven? You know, what is there for Jesus to learn? It's not just that Jesus can learn as a human in his human life. Even heavenly Jesus still gets revealed things upon his entrance into heaven. And then so he kind of uses the Holy Spirit and an angel, kind of a little bit of both, to um, communicate to um, John the book of Revelation. And honestly, I, I've said this before, I've heard Christians say that like, oh, Muslims have a very different view of inspiration of scripture than, uh, than Christians do. You know, they think that an angel came down and delivered a message to a human who then wrote it exactly how he heard it, but Christians have a different view of that. I'm like, well, have you ever read the beginning of the book of Revelation? Because that's exactly what it says is, ha is happening, is that a man was in the spirit and got a vision from an angel that had been dis dispatched from heaven who told him to write down exactly what he saw. So, hmm. uh, you know, <laughs> that that, that that's a, that's another point that um, anyway I won't be making friends with a ton of Christians for making <laughs> that point, but I, I I still think that's an important thing to say. So that sort of explains I guess what I mean by Jesus being having some power over the Holy Spirit. An example of that is he can give a revelation to John. Hmm. Okay. All right. So um, I uh, eschatology. That was <laughs> that was the, the the train of thought that I wanted to continue on. So I know that I mean there's a lot of variety of Christian views of eschatology. There's a lot of varieties of views of Islamic eschatology. But how does Jesus fit into eschatology, kind of both in the Quran and into sort of you know uh, various versions of Islamic theology on the topic? Yeah, so uh, the Quran, as I've already indicated, is a little bit uh, vague in, in reference to Jesus's role in the final things. In, in the Hadith, we have more details. In addition to what I mentioned before, there is a famous Hadith uh, that says that uh, the Day of Judgment will not uh, happen until and unless Jesus comes back down. Uh, he will uh, descend on the wings of two angels. He will arrive in the mosque in, in Damascus. And uh, the Muslims will be ready for prayer. Um, they will offer Jesus the right to uh, lead them in prayer, but uh, he will def uh, defer to the, um, to the person who was already assigned to be the imam or the leader of the prayer. He will pray with them. Then in the meantime, uh, the, the Antichrist was re wreaking havoc on earth. So Jesus will go out and he will meet the anti Antichrist uh, the Antichrist will start to dissolve on seeing Jesus uh, or in the presence of Jesus, but Jesus will finally thrust the spear through him. Uh, and so that will mark the end of the Antichrist. Then there will be a period of peace and eventually Jesus will pass away and, and be buried according to some uh, narratives. I, I started saying there is a famous hadith, but then I ended up lumping a number of narratives together and beliefs together. Uh, and, and this is the final outcome that eventually uh, Jesus will uh, pass away and be buried uh, uh, in, in Medina, in the city of the prophet, next to where the prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is buried. Interesting. So, mm -hmm. so Jesus, who's in some sort of a live state in heaven currently, not having yet actually died, comes back. He participates in prayer in Damascus and has some sort of victorious battle with an antichrist figure and then later dies and, and gets buried. Um, so does this uh, usher in any sort of messianic age or, or anything like that? Or is it uh, um, not as cosmically revolutionary as all that? Um, it, it, from what is described, I mean, this is uh, an age of peace. Um, it, it, it is mentioned in, in some famous narratives that uh, Jesus uh, will break the cross and kill the swine. And, and Muslim commentators uh, understand this to be uh, breaking not a physical cross, but, but the idea that the cross is significant. And, uh, and by killing the swine, it, it, this is a way of, um, of uh, indicating that eating swine it, it should be no more. Uh, this is how the commentators uh, render it. Of course, when we're talking about uh, the So there's a narrative. little bit of anti-Christian 
invective there if, if yes. Christians take the cross as important and generally eat pork that um, that it's sort of breaking those two errors of Christianity. Yes, and, and when, we, when we are referring to hadith, we should bear in mind that not all Muslims regard the hadiths with the same sort of level of authority. Uh, all Muslims, to be sure, regard the Quran as the word of God. But when it comes to hadith, uh, Christians are of various shades in how they regard the hadith. A classical position had developed to regard the hadith as second to the Quran, maybe even equal to the Quran, but certainly as a, 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 a source of interpretation of the Quran, the first source. And uh, various scholars have thought about the hadith corpuses as, the, as a whole as being very authoritative. Though in, in looking back at their steps in getting there, we realize now, and there are many persons like myself who uh, say we need to take a balanced approach to hadith. There are narratives which clearly developed later on and in response to discourses that were happening on the ground after the Prophet Muhammad and whom be peace and probably should not be credited back uh, to the Pro Prophet Muhammad as, as they are. Uh, so it's, you know, with, with this sort of caveat that I mention all of these uh, narratives, uh, they, there is another narrative uh, or maybe a, an extension of one of the ones I mentioned before that says that uh, um, uh, at the time when Jesus returns, uh, there will be no more of the uh, collection of what is called jizya in, in an Arabic term which is a tax that was levied on non-Muslims living within an Islamic state. So the Muslims paid what is called zakat. It's an institutionalized charity, mm -hmm. which is regarded as one of the pillars of the Islamic faith. Uh, but the non-Muslims would pay a different tax, which is called mm -hmm. a zakat, a, a, a jizya. Uh, but uh, when Jesus comes back, there will be no more jizya. Um, so some interpret this to mean that uh, Jesus will wage a war uh, alongside Muslims uh, against others, and and there will be no others in the end apart from Jesus mm -hmm. and and Muslims. So, so almost that Jesus will participate in the correcting of the errors of Christianity. Yes, this is the Muslim. Uh, uh, I mean, hope that is reflected in in these in these narratives. Yeah, interesting. Um, and then, does Jesus play any role in judgment or um, uh, anything like that? So there, there are um, indications in hadith that uh, on the day of judgment, uh, people will approach their prophets uh, to intercede on their behalf um, before God. And, and the Quran seems to indicate as well that in a way, no intercession can happen without the permission of God, of course. But God will grant such permission to individuals and uh, leaders of people will have, you know, a, a sort of permission to intercede on behalf of their people. So in which case God will grant his grace to people because they belonged to, let's say, a, a, a group which was intended to be on, on the right path. Though individuals may not always have the, uh, you know, the acumen to decide things for themselves, but if they align themselves to a group, then uh, in, you know, uh, theoretically at least, or by intention, they intend to follow what is right, even though in their own minds, they may not have it all, you know, clear in their minds. Um, so the idea is that prophets will intercede for their people. So those who uh, align themselves with Jesus, we are the followers of Jesus, uh, they might be accepted, uh, you know, due to Jesus's intercession with God. But that mm -hmm. doesn't make mean that Jesus is going to be the only intercessor. Uh, other prophets too will be intercessors before God for their people. Interesting, interesting. Um, so I guess a couple couple other questions sort of getting we, we've you know found a couple differences between us but I guess uh, um, I, I maybe want to focus on some of those questions uh, a little bit more directly um, so why don't Muslims like the phrase son of God well perhaps because the son of God phrase has been so misunderstood um, you know, when we say son of God, then somebody starts to think, well, you know, he must have the same nature. Um, in fact, some Trinitarians have uh, used this kind of argument with me. They said, you know, the uh, son of a donkey is a donkey, so the son of God must be a God somehow, and so on. So to avoid that sort of confusion, it seems that it, it developed in Muslim culture that we do not refer to anyone as the son of God. In fact, the Quran does not refer to anyone as the son of God. And there is a verse of the Quran that interestingly, alludes to the fact that uh, Jews and Christians are saying that they are sons of God, 
Uh, but the Quran tells Muslims, ask them, why would God then punish you for your sins? So it's not clear entirely what this verse means, uh, although the uh, upshot of it is that Muslims are, you know, uh, you know, they don't want to touch that term uh, mm -hmm. to say son of God. So either specifically of Jesus or in even a broader sense of kind of everyone being children of God or something like that. Yes, yes. So we don't speak of uh, people being children of God. We speak of uh, ourselves as being servants of God and righteous people as being good servants of God. Mm -hmm. So I, I guess if the Quran teaches the virgin birth, who, who then is Jesus's father? <laughs> I, I, is the, the, the gap that seems to come to my mind. Yeah, apparently some people ask the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, precisely this. And uh, the, there is a narrative in Hadith. She, you have the Quran, and then you have narratives that, mm -hmm. that explain how the Quran came to be as it is. Mm -hmm. So a, a narrative says that uh, the Quran, of course, according to many narratives, was revealed a piece at a time to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. So now some other narratives give you like stories about each, like individual pieces. This piece came to be revealed in reference to such and such an incident. So uh, according to these uh, narratives, uh, there were some Christians from a region called Najran who came to dispute with the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and this was one of the questions they asked him. So the Quran's reply is in the third chapter, uh, revealed on that occasion to answer this question. Um, and uh, at the beginning of this chapter, it says, God is the one who shapes you in the wombs the way he wants. So the, the Quranic answer seems to be that God shaped Jesus the way God wants. So God is his creator, as God is the creator of uh, everyone else. And in the same surah, in the 59th verse, uh, we, we read that uh, the example of Jesus in the sight of God is as the example of Adam. God created the ladder from clay and, uh, and said to him, be, and he was. So um, again, in the same chapter, when Mary asks, how can I have a child when no mortals touch me? The Quran's reply is, uh, you know, when God uh, decrees a thing, uh, he only says to it, be, and it is. Uh, so, so we have in this chapter a kind of comprehensive answer to say that God is the creator of Jesus as he is of everyone else. Mm -hmm. Although still a little bit unique in that being, you know, uh, miraculously um, conceived as opposed to uh, normally conceived. Yeah, of course, the way Muslim commentators uh, look at this is to say, well, you know, it only proves the power of God. It doesn't prove uh, the power of Jesus. Uh, Interesting. Uh, yeah. So like, um, as a, as a biblical Unitarian, I would, of course, say that, like, Jesus isn't the Son of God in the sense of, you know, being begotten in the heavenly realm of the Father or something like that, and that um, he isn't the Son of God, certainly in some sort of, like, Zeus coming down and getting a lady pregnant kind of way either, and, you know, what the Quran says about the virgin birth, you know, just uh, God, God can say, and it is, that that's actually very similar to the, you know, the the Holy Spirit will overpower you and you will become uh, pregnant, that sort of thing. That idea seems very similarly matched. But as a biblical Unitarian, I still think that the phrase son of God is extremely important in that Jesus has some sort of unique sense in which he is connected to God that makes him not not human, but uh, as a special special place among humans. And that, uh, and that the phrase son of God, you know, it's used in the Old Testament for King, like King David and a couple of the, the other things as a way of, you know, communicating the, the king's sort of special relationship and unique relationship to God over and among his people. And that Jesus is sort of that in like the kind of eternal and perfect and archetypal sense of that. But he's still human uh, fully as a created, you know, um, uh, divinely empowered, you know, divinely um, miraculously conceived person inside Mary. And I guess I wonder, you know, what, does a Muslim still find that usage of the term offensive or maybe just less offensive? Well, uh, let me say that when, when Muslims look at the New Testament, uh, uh, although we don't use the term son of God in reference to Jesus from within our tradition, uh, we can understand uh, why it, you know, it, it, it makes sense within the New Testament narrative, especially given the Old Testament background. In the Old Testament, as we already indicated, 
uh, so many persons were called sons of God. So Muslims generally understand this term son of God in the New Testament as a reference to Jesus, as indicating that he is what we might say in Arabic, uh, you know, Habibullah, one who is beloved to God. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and nothing more than that. And it is my humble view that uh, it, it, you know, in the New Testament, sometimes it uh, more than this is indicated. Uh, but that's how Muslims generally yeah. would, in a simple manner, make sense of the uh, use of the term son of God. And in that sense, they wouldn't find it offensive. Yeah. And a thing that I would also say, another important idea for, for biblical Unitarians is that Jesus sort of inherits the kingdom and power from God, his father. So part of the explanation for Jesus's status now is that it's like a son who has been bequeathed his inheritance. And in the culture of the time, the, the eldest son was given the inheritance of the father, and then the eldest son was in, in charge of divvying it up. That was his role in the family, and a good son would do that in a fair way. A bad son might do that in an unfair way. There's actually a story in the New Testament where someone's like, hey, Jesus, my brother isn't giving me any of the inheritance. Please make him do it. And Jesus says, who made me judge over you? Which is a weird thing for God to say. <laughs> but, um, but so that sort of idea that Jesus is the inheritor of, in some sense, God's estate and is in charge of divvying it up to whom he chooses is sort of an important theological idea. And that's connecting Jesus as the son of God in a kind of more specific sense than just, you know, we're all children of God or we're all beloved of God or even some special people are maybe, you know, more chosen than others. But Jesus as like the only begotten, right? The unique elder son is in charge of, of those special roles by virtue of that position. <laughs> so, um, but anyway, we, we should be wrapping up soon. Um, but I guess I have I have one last question or, or topic, and it's around worship. And this is probably I, I, I'll, I, I biblical Unitarians disagree with each other on some topics, and we disagree a little bit around the topic of of is Jesus worshipped and in what sense. So one question that I had is sometimes the word worship is used in the exclusive sense of something that you should only do to God, right? And to do it to anyone other than God is idolatry, right? And Jews and Christians and Muslims can all agree on that in some sense, even if we disagree on the details. But the English word worship also has the connotation of bowing down and giving reverence to someone. Like, like in like the Anglican liturgy for a wedding in the 18th century or something like that, it says, uh, and the wife like worships her husband in, in the, the wedding liturgy, and it's not an act of idolatry, right? It, she's giving honor and, and submission to her husband, right? It's, there's an older usage of the word that's something more like bow and reverence that isn't, you know, religious, you know, idolatry or something like that. So how does, how does worship uh, kind of fit into this discussion? Hmm. Well, well, Muslims are very strict about the idea of worship, um, you know, so we don't pray to anyone other than the unseen creator of the heavens and the earth, the God of Abraham, Moses, and, and Jesus. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the items which are known to be acts of worship, we, we don't like uh, transfer that to some other uh, object or what, what are the specific acts that count as worship. Uh, prayer, for example, prayer, uh, a supplication, like, mm -hmm. uh, you know, praying to some unseen entity. Um, mm -hmm. uh, we can ask a, a, a visible entity for our needs. Uh, you mm -hmm. know, somebody has something to grant us, we can go and you can ask your something. boss for a raise. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But but if we, we're talking about the unseen world, and we start, uh, you know, pleading with some entity in the unseen world, this is taught to compromise uh, the, the monotheism that we hold okay. dear. Um, so to answer your question, do we worship the same God? Uh, as long as uh, Christians are worshiping what they refer to as the Father uh, of the Lord Jesus Christ, um, uh, then we are we are worshiping the same God. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and that that's why I would say I think my what I view as the correct answer to the question of is is do we worship Jesus is that in the religious sense of the word, which I think in the Old Testament is primarily denoted by sacrifice, giving a sacrifice to someone, right? You even mentioned that story in Acts of the, 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 um, the Gentiles wanting to worship Paul and, and Silas, and that, that, you know, the way they wanted to do that was to give an animal sacrifice to them. 
and that we think of sort of Jesus as the ultimate sacrifice, probably an idea that you disagree with, but and we think of Jesus as the ultimate sacrifice to God, and that in some sense, that is Jesus worshiping God, and like I said, Jesus is our high priest, and we worship along with him, so we don't give that final kind of religious sort of sacrificial definition of worship to God, but we give high honors and praise and reverence and submission to Jesus as our Lord and Savior, but it's 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 nothing that would be on sort of what would be befitting of a king, but he's sort of like the perfect ultimate king, so it's that to kind of its perfect magnified extent. And I, I was wondering how, how would a Muslim find that offensive or not? <laughs> Uh, well, I mean, it, it wouldn't fit with our idea of monotheism, but I can understand how this evolved, because we can see in the Old Testament in 1 Corinthians chapter 29, verse 20, uh, that the people uh, bowed down to God and the king. Mm -hmm. uh, so it seems that uh, reverencing the king in this particular way uh, was, you know, in, in ancient times acceptable. And uh, some of that has, you know, survived into the, the New Testament. Uh, in fact, uh, recently I was taken aback by, by a verse which struck me for the first time. Uh, it's somewhere near the end of the book of Revelation where the, um, the seer um, uh, falls on his knees to worship the angel that was speaking to him. And the angel says to him, don't do this. I'm just yes. a creature like you. And of course, then he desisted. But uh, the, the very idea that he could be about to worship one who by this time he should have known, I would think, uh, is an angel as opposed to God or Jesus. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I was taken aback by, by that. So from the Muslim perspective, um, you know, it, it's not something that we do, but I can understand within the context of the New Testament, uh, you know, why people did this. And, uh, and I can understand why some of that survives into uh, biblical uh, Unitarianism. Sure. All right, so I guess the I'll I'll just say, um, do you have any closing remarks or any final things you want to get off your chest? Well, no, I, I mean, given the time, I would uh, uh, you know just like to wrap it up and say that uh, you know I've, it's been my honor, Sam, speaking with you, and uh, it's been a delightful conversation. I, I wish all of our conversations between Muslims and Christians were like this, in which we explore ideas uh, without having you know uh, a, a, you know some um, axe to grind. We're just exploring ideas. We're just uh, learning from each other. And uh, there is no attempt to get a one upmanship on, on the other. You know, I've uh, been involved in a lot of uh, debates, but it's, it's because people challenge me for, to have debates. Uh, and and to, to be uh, sure, when, when I was younger, my beard was black. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I used to challenge people to debates uh, as well. In, but uh, over time, uh, with maturity, I came to realize that people are as they are, People hardly change their ideas. Uh, in any case, people arrive at their ideas uh, through very complex means and through many interconnections. And uh, you know, one debate is not going to settle the issue. So, uh, you know, it's better for us to have friendly conversations, to chat nicely, uh, learn from each other, explore concepts, and uh, do some more research, and then pray to God for the rest, because only He can change the minds and hearts of, of people. Um, and, uh, and I'm so glad that our discussion was of that nature. And, uh, and I just wish that more discussions uh, were like this. But uh, some, some people will not uh, come to a platform to have this kind of cordial discussion because in their minds, uh, it's like, uh, it's a do or die. Like they, they must prove their point and, and they, they, they will only prove that through a debate. They, they wanna put you down and prove themselves right. And, uh, and to me, that, that is not in harmony with our religious uh, ideals. Our religious ideals are about humility and, and about giving glory to God. So I'm so glad that we were able to do some of that today. I hope we have, and I hope that God is pleased with our um, little endeavor. And I thank you for giving me this opportunity to chat with you uh, in such a friendly manner. Well, I wholeheartedly agree with everything that you just said. Thank you very much, uh, Shabir, for coming on my channel and talking to me uh, about these things. And I really enjoyed it and I learned a lot from it. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you too. All the best.